Hello. Uh, welcome to another Golf Course Trades event. Uh, I'm Sharon Scott Wilson, publisher of Golf Course Trades, and we are very privileged today to have Jay Flemma conducting an interview with uh, several gentlemen. Uh, in his opening paragraph of his latest article, which will soon be available in Golf Course Trades. It's called Masterful Stephen K. G K. Restoration Vaults, Force Gates, Banks, uh, Course to Prominence. Uh, Jay says, Golf Course Architect Stephen K. made a discovery of historical import at fabled Force Gate Country Club in New Jersey. So today, Jay will walk us through this masterful restoration along with Stephen uh, and developer Chris Schiavone. And pardon me if I use the authentic Italian pronunciation. <laughs> uh, Chris is with RDC Group and the head super Don Asinski. So Jay, I will back out and let you perform the introductions and conduct your interview. And thank you. And thank you too, Sharon. And everyone, welcome to this month's Golf Course Trades webinar. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce all of you that have not heard about this wonderful golf course in New Jersey to learn about it because it is one of the great stories in golf. It has been since its founding in 1931 and it continues now carrying that spirit through into the 21st century. I'm talking about the Banks course at Forest Gate Country Club in Monroe Township, New Jersey. And my special guests today are indeed RDC developer and owner Chris Schiavone, who's on our left. In the middle, you'll see Stephen Kay, one of the great golf course architects in America and New York City's favorite son of a golf course architect and head superintendent Donna Sinsky. Everybody, welcome to this month's webinar. Thank you for doing this. Hello, Jay. Thanks for having us, Jay. Chris, tell us a little bit about the history of Forest Gate Country Club. Well, Forest Gate Country Club was founded 90 years ago, 1931, uh, by a gentleman uh, by the name of John Forster, who uh, has a name that some people recognize because he was one of the founders of the insurance firm Crum and Forster. Um, he had this wonderful piece of property out in central Jersey, which was a very rural part of the state back then, obviously built up a lot since then. The New Jersey Turnpike is right uh, nearby. We're right, uh, right near the exit here at... Uh, 8A on, on the New Jersey Turnpike. A lot of people know New Jersey by the by the Turnpike exit numbers. And so he developed, he had a farm and he wanted to have a golf course and he had some thoughts about uh, his, his uh, employees and having it as a place of recreation and wellness. He was kind of ahead of his time in that sense. Uh, and he developed this uh, country club alongside his, his farm, Forest Gate Farms. And uh, it's called Forest Gate because he took the first four letters of his last name, Forster, and he added the first four letters of his wife's maiden name, which was Gatenby, and that's how the name Forest Gate came into existence. And unfortunately for, for Mr. Forster, he passed away in 1931, the year that the club opened, as did, um, as did Charles Banks, who designed the golf course, um, and who also died in 1931 at the young age of 49, which I think you would agree, Jay, is really unfortunate because he was, he was a great architect. And had he lived another 15 or 20 years, I think a lot more people would have uh, been the beneficiary of some future designs that he would have, he would have put together. But uh, we have a, a wonderful property here in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, it, it, it grew and added another 18 holes, but, but kept the original design of the Banks course uh, almost exactly as it was when it was first created. And so it's, it's seen a lot of development and a couple of different owners. We got involved uh, in the late 90s, and uh, it's been a thrill to be associated with Forest Gate Country Club. Now, you bring up a great point, Chris, when you talk about Charles Steam Shovel Banks, who's the last in a great architectural bloodline that began with Charles Blair McDonald, who worked with Seth Rayner, and then when McDonald died, Rayner hired Banks. And then both Rayner and Banks end up dying. Uh, and so we have bookends from 1910 to 1931 in the United States 
of these courses of this bloodline. And of course, 1932, Banks went over to Tucker's Point in Bermuda. But uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about how McDonald Rainer Banks courses have blossomed in this the second golden age of golf course architecture. And in particular, tell us a little bit about why it's important to study them and how they are brought to life at Forest Gate. Well, C.B. McDonald was one of the first golf architects in the United States, and he did the first 18-hole golf course in the United States, Chicago Golf Club. A lot of people think it's first 18 is out east, it's not Chicago Golf Club. And who were the experts at the turn of the century, then that, that turn of the century, were the British, the Irish, the Scottish golf pros who came to America to teach Americans this game of golf. And they said, your golf courses are okay, but they're not great like ours are. So he sort of took offense to that, and he went uh, to Great Britain. And he went around, he went to the best golf courses, and he played with the best players. And by the way, uh, uh, C.B. McDonald won the first U.S. amateur. So he was an accomplished player. And he played with the best players in Europe. He said, what are the best golf courses? When he got to those best golf courses, what are the best holes? So he basically came up with 25 template golf holes that were all from Great Britain, except for one hole, which we'll be talking about later, that was at a golf course outside of Paris called Baritz. Uh, it was actually the name of the golf course. Sadly, it doesn't exist anymore because it was bombed out of, you know, bombed out of existence from uh, World War II. So C.B. McDonald, when they, they said to him, well, your golf courses have to be on sandy dunes, and he thought that was fine because there's sandy dunes out uh, on the other side of the lake uh, of, of, of uh, where Chicago was. You can go to Michigan, and there's sand dunes in Michigan. And they said to him, lake? What do you mean lake? And, and he, they said to him that it needed to be salt water. They, they don't think they knew why, but they said that. So when he got back to the United States, he actually went out to Long Island and he bought property next to Shinnecock. And he built the, the first real great golf course in the United States, uh, National Golf Links of America, which is right next to Shinnecock, way on the eastern end of Long Island. When he built that golf course, we're talking about, Jay, you know, horses and mules and wheelbarrows. There's no bulldozers. 1910, 1911. So, and he moved almost a million yards, they think. So he hired Seth Rayner, who was a civil engineer. And Seth Rayner... Uh, joined him and loved golf so much that he basically gave up his civil engineering practice, although his brother was also a civil engineer, and the Rainer Engineering Group still exists in Long Island. Uh, and then several years later, Charles Banks joined them. And by the way, you did get something I think wrong. You said, actually, uh, Seth Rainer passed away, I think 50-something years old. Then Charles Banks did, and C.B. McDonald, who was the oldest, actually outlived them all, and he lived into his 80s. Uh, but he had no interest in designing any golf courses, basically, after he did National mm -hmm. Golf Links. He would assist Seth Rayner a little bit in the beginning, but not much. Basically, it was Seth Rayner, and then it was Charles Banks. Uh, so they had these 25 template holes uh, that is actually amazing how they would go to sites, different golf courses, and, and, and fit them into the property. Uh, and what's amazing, and what I found amazing uh, about Forsgate uh, uh, Charles Banks was starting to get bolder and bolder and bolder as his career was going on. And this is the last golf course he did in the United States. Uh, I've done work uh, at several Charles Banks golf courses. In fact, I'm renovating one right now uh, that's the only municipal one that he ever did, Hendricks Field, which is owned by Essex County. It's a municipal golf course. But everything is at a less... You know, instead of bunkers being very, very deep, I'm not sure how many of your listeners here have been to this golf course, but some of these golf courses, some of these bunkers, I mean, are easily 15, 20, 30 feet deep below the green. Sure. In fact, I'm going to throw up a picture of one of those right uh, now. I'm yeah, going to throw yeah, a picture yeah, of one yeah, of the templates. municipal golf course, he knew that it was going to be municipal. So everything is more like just three or four or five feet deep. Yeah, what you don't have in that photograph is you don't see somebody standing. Uh, they would realize that that bunker is 15, 20 feet deep. Uh, the bunkers are very, very deep, and how uh, Adani does such a great job maintaining them is, is beyond me. Uh, I would also want to be like him. I'd want to be the, the boss, the superintendent, to say, go mow that. I wouldn't necessarily want to be the guy who actually does it. Uh, 
but when I got here about 15 years ago, uh, the golf course was just it, it, a wonderful because it hasn't changed over the years. It's basically been the same golf course. Now, what did change in a few places, and the thing that bothered me the most when I first got here was that, you know, you realize when, when he did the golf course banks in 1931, there were no carts. Then carts when it came in and basically started to come in the late 70s. And then in the, in, in the 80s, they realized we could make money with carts. So then cart paths were started to be put in. And there was a cart path right in the middle of the fairway, in the middle of the par 3 seventh hole, the, the reverse redan hole. Also, some people call it a mirror redan. Regardless, there was this. Or in mid year, they've right they used that. Right in the middle of your picture, that's that's the hole. But that fairway was up higher towards the tee, and it, it just you didn't see the bunker. And uh, Chris and I realized this was a hole that needed to be renovated. So we lowered the hill, we lowered the rain, the, the the hill of it, the ridge of it. We moved the cart path away to the right, so it was out of your basic visual picture. We used that material to enlarge the tees. That was one thing. So a lot of the tees, especially the par three tees, were too small. So that was one of the first things we ever did here, so the golfer could see this wonderful revival. So let's talk a little bit specifically about some of these template holes and take a look at some of these pictures so that you can explain to everyone about how McDonald, Rayner, and Banks, and in particular this case Banks, would go around the country and then tell us a little bit about each of the particular ones at Forest Gate. So uh, here we go. Here's a good one. This hole actually had the largest screen in America for a while, didn't it? I, I can't make out which hole. Number five. That's number five. Okay, my vision isn't that good. <clears throat> yeah, number five, right? Okay, thank you. The punch hole. Uh, the, the punch hole where we are trying, as I said before, that this golf course really hasn't changed that much. And I almost think the word, instead of saying we're restoring it, or we're unmasking it. Uh, and, and that's what Donnie and, and I have been doing. Uh, Donald and I have been trying to, to, a lot of unmowed grasses were put in, of fescues and love grass and stuff like that were put in back in, in the mid and late 80s. And we're trying to take a lot of those out and broaden and widen it so that this punch ball, if you do hit a shot a little bit offline, because it's surrounded like by a horseshoe of a berm, and it, and it could, and the ball would bounce into the green before. Now there's a when I got here, that unmowed grass, and you got here, Donnie, you've been here, what, how many years now? Six, seven years? Fifth season. Fifth season. The grass really came down almost to the collar of the green. Now we've been bringing that back so that ball can bounce in towards the center of the green, which was is what the concept of a, of a punch hole hole is. It's generally a very long par four with a, somewhat of a blind green so that because it was blind, uh, and you got to realize that when they did it, they didn't have yardages, uh, the punch ball actually helped assist the golfer by kicking the ball towards the center of the green. Now, you bring up a great point there, Stephen, and two things about that. The first is, one of the things that makes this punch ball unique is that the green is actually convex and the ball is the surrounds. That's very rare for the McDonald Rainer Banks lexicon. Yeah, it's sort of convex. It depends on what the specific area you look at. The actual and, when, and, and the audience here is when Jay says it's convex, is there's some portions of the putting surface that could kick the ball away. But but if you but it's still not going to kick your ball away that far because once you get to the collar and and the rough, what are you mowing now? About five to seven yards of rough oh, before right. you get to the unmowed grass. At least, at least, okay. So that does that does take the ball into the green. Uh, so it is a little bit different. The punch bowl that's at Sleepy Hollow. Yes, uh, great does, example. It also does have some movement in the green that you could call convex. But the, the, the vast majority of the green there at Sleepy Hollow, as here at, and that was designed by Seth Rayner, as here by Charles Banks, is that if you do miss the green a little bit by a few yards, you're going to have that advantage that that kicks the ball in. Now, let's jump forward. We've talked about the Redan. Let's talk about one of the other 
museum pieces, okay? And by the way, we'll recall no less a personage than Rand Morissette, now the rankings editor for Golf Magazine, said that the par threes at Forest Gate are as good as the par threes at Pine Valley, okay? And here's a perfect example, the gorgeous short with a capital S at number 12, which is called Horseshoe in this case. And we can bring in Donnie. Donnie, how do you maintain that gorgeous thumbprint in that green so perfectly and get the ball to roll so absolutely true on those fierce contours? Uh, you know, maintaining greens with this kind of contouring, um, you know, I, I played around with different machines. Um, you know, I, I've, I've kind of dialed in, uh, you know, with the machines I like, but, you know, it's not, let me tell you, maintaining something like that, um, the first time I sprayed it, because I, I, I drove across it on a sprayer and I thought to myself, how am I going to spray this thing uh, without a spray rock? But I've, I've gotten good at it. I think the first time I sprayed that green, I went down the side of the hill with the sprayer. Um, <laughs> So it is a bit of a challenge, and, you know, when we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the steepness of those banks, my crew, um, I've got to send out a crew of six guys, um, and it takes them two days to uh, to mow, which I, when I say you guys are mowing bunker banks, you know, I hear that, I hear that grumble, because they're dropping rotary mowers down the hillsides with ropes, and uh, very, very labor intensive. Um, so, and you know that's one of the biggest challenges at Fours Gate with maintaining these these uh, these surrounds and, and these you know what I call the green surround. You know it's really really impressive surrounds. And when we were talking about you know the steepness of the banks, you know I measured out the, the steepest bunker I've found or I think I found is thirty nine feet deep. That's on uh, number number eight. So, you know, they're pretty, uh, pretty steep. Uh, that, that's, what, that's basically a four-story building. <laughs> <laughs> I think the bunker in particular you're talking about is the one that I've dubbed Black Lung Bunker because you get black lung disease trying to get out of that thing. On the left side of the green is the... That's the one. Right. Yeah, and, and, and then also, how deep, if you've measured it, is the bunker on nine, the one at the base of the green, the one I call the Sea of Tranquility? <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that's... That's similar. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, it's got to be at least similar. Like that. Yeah. Um, Jay, can I make one quick comment on the, uh, on the 12th hole there? Yep, we're going to go right back to it. Here you go. So many members think of that hole as the punch bowl hole because of that, that uh, configuration in the center of the green there. That uh, the, the names get mixed up sometimes. I, 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 they they could tell it's the punch bowl. They, they think of number twelve, the par three. Um, and I also wanted to mention that eighth hole, the the very deep bunk, bunker that you're referring to. There's a story that Ben Hogan, who played the course here in the fifties, uh, went out sideways out of that bunker because he couldn't figure out how to get it up thirty plus feet. Oh sure, you that's you it, get it. if you get the wrong lie in that bunker, that's your only hope. So, uh, it, it's you raise another interesting point, Chris. In that, uh, I was going to ask Stephen if we go back to number five, teach us something because it is a blind shot to a punch bowl green, and you are coming in approaching over that bunker that you can see on the right edge of the picture there. Why is that not an Alps hole? You know, a, a lot of these names of these golf holes uh, are basically taken from the original holes in Great Britain because they named their holes there. Uh, but I'm going to be honest, as a golf architect, uh, I was doing it for a very long time, and I teach a golf, a his, you know, a golf course history design class at Rutgers University in the two-year program. Uh, and I talk about it. So I, I guess I consider myself somewhat of an expert. There are certain holes like the Eden Hole. If you look at different Eden Holes, Jay, there isn't an, an easy way to really say a hole's an Eden Hole. Uh, there are certain holes that are very simple to say what they are, like the Redan or Reverse Redan, you know, or the Short or the Long or the Principal's Nose. Uh, those holes are very simple. And I think that's why a lot of the people and once the internet started and 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 ran ran's uh 
uh, website, uh, Golf Club Atlas, and, and the, the, the people who love to talk about golf course architecture. The reason they love uh, uh, these three architects is because there are names to the golf holes. And it's easy to look at a hole and try to figure out what it is relatively. But it, but you're right. Some of them are difficult. Like, is that an Alps hole versus a punch ball? You could maybe argue that point. Except the fact that there's the berm that literally surrounds uh, 207, almost 270 degrees of the green. Or 180, or 180 to 270 yeah. degrees. Uh, that's why they probably would call it a punch ball. But you could have a good argument that, that, that it is an Alps. And by the way, just... For, for this, for our, your audience there, there are, and if you guys like golf architecture, people watching this, whether you're golf pros or, or golf superintendents, uh, some of the books that are really good on it is there's a book, and I don't know if you want to walk this up there, is, is, a, uh, is Classic Golf Holes. And Classic Golf Holes was, is, was written by Cornish and Graves, two golf course architects. Another great, why are you up there? Another great book. That was published in 1927. By the way, the first one was published in the early 2000s. That was published in 1927, uh, Golf Architecture in America by George Thomas, who designed uh, Riviera. And this is the book by George Bado about C.B. McDonald and about the building of National Golf Links. These are three great books on golf course architecture. There's other great books. There's you know, The Architects of Golf by Ron Witten. There are wonderful books written on golf architecture, but I think these three are probably the three that talk about these template holes, Jay, the most. Now, by the way, uh, it's funny that you should say that because there's quite the wonderful argument going on in the chat right now. We've got a good 30 people from as far away as Black Creek, Country Club in Tennessee and local members of Forest Gate as well. So we got everybody throughout the first half of the country and they're all chiming in, arguing with each other. Well, I think it is an Alps. Well, I think it's a punch ball. It's fantastic. I wish you could see it. Uh, and in particular, there, there was a question here from one of the readers that wants to know, do Alps holes usually have bunkers in front or something that you have to carry, get over into the bowl area? Well, I think the answer, as far as I know, is that it depends on the course. I've seen both. Well, aren't there components of holes such that they're not mutually exclusive? In other words, can't they be a punch bowl and an Alps hole at the same time? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me, and, and in a very, it, 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 I'm very happy that it happened that people started to respect these template halls, respect these golf courses that these three architects did, as well as respect these halls and these designs that more of the current architects have done. Because when I started in the business, I came from Michigan, and I worked with Bill Newcomb in Michigan, who was the first guy with Pete died. I came back to New York, and I was starting to do variations on a theme of golf holes. Some of the writers were really criticizing me in the late in the late eighties and the early nineties. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're you're doing that. And I go, guys, you know, one of the greatest pieces of music is Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody of a theme of Paganini. It was Paganini's music, this beautiful piece of classical music that he did a variation on. What's the problem? Finally, and I actually think it was a Carl Olson who was the superintendent at National Golf Links in the nineties who started to unmask National Golf Links and started to, to bring back bunkers that were taken out and, and cut down trees that were planted by whomever uh, and bring back what the original design intent was and, and, and brought back the famousness of C.B. McDonald, which then led to, to uh, Seth Rayner and Charles Banks. Uh, and people started to realize how great these courses are. And what Cliff just said, they didn't copy these holes like a Xerox copy machine. They found them where they fit on the land. The concept to fit the topography that they had. Yeah, they right. found where they fit on the land. Right, Ex exactly right. So I just now, on that it. note, Stephen, let's uh, let's focus in for a moment on 
one of the other great museum pieces. I've got it up here, and again, we can bring Donnie in and Chris. I'm sure there's some marvelous stories of 17, the Brits. You mentioned it before, Stephen, uh, from, from the course in France when McDonald was building National Golf Links of America. He actually didn't build a Brits there, but he did include it in his template holes. Uh, tell us a little bit about the features of the Brits hole and about how Forest Gates is one of the great crown jewels of Baritzes in the entire world. Well, I, I'm going to first let Chris talk about it first, because he was here before I was. He's the owner of the golf course. Um, uh, well, explain me, what the hole was first. Let me tell you how we got to getting Stephen to come in and, and do the restoration of the 17th green. So when we uh, purchased the club, only the back third of what's now the Beeritz Green was, was green. The rest of it was being mowed as fairway. And I would play the hole, and I kept looking at it because of the, the length of the bunkers and the, the six-foot valley in the middle of this piece of fairway between the bunkers before you got to this back piece that was the green. And it just looked so odd to me. It just didn't look like something you'd ever design that way. And so finally, I, I called Stephen, and I said, can you tell me whether I'm looking at this wrong or whether this was all supposed to be uh, green? And so he came in, not only saw it from an architectural point of view, but also did soil samples. And it was clear that it was designed to be all green. And that's why we went through the process of bringing it back. And now it's about 18,000 square feet. It's almost 90 yards from front to back. You mentioned number five as being one of the biggest greens in the state years ago. Obviously, greens get average bigger than they, they used to, but at 11,000 square feet, it's still a big green by today's standards, but it's the second largest green at Forsgate. Number 17 is the largest. Right, right. And so when, when, when Chris had me come in, and, and I, I knew Banks's concept that it was supposed to be a Baritz, which is basically a three-level green, a uh, front level, gigantic valley in the middle, and then another upper portion. It's basically the size of three greens. Uh, I've done Baritzes where we didn't have as much room, so we might do 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, where it's 12,000. And what is this one again? This one about 18. Yeah, right, 18. Um, so I took a soil probe, and Donnie wasn't here yet as the superintendent. And uh, I, did, uh, I did some soil probes in the middle of the upper portion. And I yeah. wanted to ignore that top inch to two inches of top dressing sand. So I ignored that, and I wanted to see what was below that. Uh, I we put that we put these samples on the collar. We just took carefully took them out of the soil probe, put them down. Then I went to the middle of the of the valley. Same thing. Uh, and actually, before I went to the front portion of the green, I went way out in the fairway, and I went way out in the rough. I went out in the rough and took soil samples, brought it back, put it down carefully, and compared them. Then started doing the lower portion, and tried to find the front of the green. And we got very close to finding exactly where the front of the green was. And it's something that was interesting. After I was doing this, I was talking uh, to, the, I happened to go to Chicago. My sister-in-law lives in Lake Forest. So I went up to Shore Acres, Jay. Yes. And, and Tim Davis, I think was his name, was the superintendent there. This is a about this, uh, a little bit after when we started to, to do the green. And what we started to do was start to lower the height of cut and aerate and top dress. And I went there and he told me a story that when he first got to Shore Acres, he just thought it was the back portion. When Ron Witten, the architectural critic for Golf I just visited, and he challenged him and he says, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. I, don't, I think it's just the back because under all the greens at Shore Acres, Seth Rayner, who was the designer, put four-inch layer of cinders in. Right. So he came out with a cup cover, and he went to where do you want me to go? And he went down, and sure enough, the cinders were there. <laughs> so he did the same thing we did. And what we did is we slowly lowered the height from fairway, which was 0.5 or 0.55, and slowly lowered it. We core aerated, I think, four times a year, two times in the spring, two times in the fall. We also, when instead of the vertical mowing, which he was doing every two weeks in top dressing, we now started doing what was going to be the green, vertical mowing and top dressing. It basically, Jay, took 18 months to bring the fairway down. And I'm pretty sure, didn't you have a, a sign that they were on the green and weren't allowed to chip or pitch? 
They had to take if they wanted to chip or pitch, they had to take it over the collar and yeah, during the transition during, during that eighteen really months. Two seasons. Right, right. During that eighteen months. Right. Uh it's it is I've been I've been to a lot of Baritz J. It's probably it's the I can't say it's the deepest valley, but it's the deepest and the widest valley. I've seen some valleys that deep, but there really wasn't any pin placements in it. Right. Very rarely. You have now tell 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 them how long how do you move your pins around? Um you know, I, I me personally I always like going front, middle, back. Um, but obviously in that green twenty thousand square feet, like that's what I figure on the spray or what it what it says, but um you got a lot of a lot of options. I mean you can go anywhere, but uh, on on the Brits, um, I leave it up to my guys. Like, but they're, it's generally front, middle, back. So you have no problem being in the valley in the middle. No, I love. Oh, it. I love the pin in the valley. Yeah. Hang on a second. Here's a picture with the pin in the valley. I mean, yeah. it's a fun location. Right. There's <laughs> also a thumbprint in the back that I've seen the pin and the yeah. thumbprint in the back. That's right. And there's a mound at each corner, and I remember the year that I came in second in the Writers' Championship and lost by one stroke, I three-putted because the pin was behind the mound on the back left, and there was no way for me to two-putt from the front of the green. <laughs> but uh, We're getting down to time to take a few more questions. Uh, this one is from... I'm going to butcher this poor fellow's name. This is from Joe Del Guercio. He wants to know if anybody thinks that the bunker back right on 16 might be the hardest bunker on the golf course. Back right on 16. That's a deep That's a deep bunker, and depending on the pin placement, uh, yeah. hard to get anywhere near the pin from there. Thank the good Lord I've never been in that bunker. <laughs> Uh, it could be. You could, you, could, you could argue on five or six bunkers at this golf course are the deepest. What do you think? You're a very, very good player, Donnie. What do you think? Uh, I, I, I used to play a little bit, but but at, every bunker, I mean, like I say, when you're down in, like, say, number eight, you can't see the green. I mean, that's how deep these bunkers yeah. are. The other thing about that bunker on the back of 16 is it's the, the square footage of it. It's one of the larger bunkers. So if you're on the far end of that, you almost have the equivalent of a, a, a long bunker shot as opposed to something closer to, right, the, right. to the green, which makes right. it even more right. difficult. That, that 16, by the way, is one of my favorite greens at the golf course. Uh, that's the uh, uh, plateau, right? Oh, it has yes. the front right plateau right. and the back plateau. Right, a little bit similar to another hole from North Berwick, which, you know, by the way, is a marvelous golf course. If any of you people have not gone to North Berwick with the original Redan hole, this you need to, and then you're not just going to, you're going to love the whole golf course. It's just, it's a wonderful. The North 16th North North hole, North. coincidentally or not coincidentally, uh, which is uh, at Essex County Country Club, mm -hmm. which is a Banks course, has, has that same green. Right. Little smaller dimensions in one of the uh, plateaus, right. but a very similar green, and it happens also to be the 16, right. which is right. also a par four and also a slight dog leg left. Right. And, and Jay, I, I want to say that, that that the remarkable thing I found when I got here is this golf course, and there's a lot of golf courses like this in the country where they really never change them much. There are a lot of Seth Rayner and Charles Banks golf courses, you know, that have you know these. That, that had when they were originally built those steep slopes and basically flat bunkers that were changed over the years where guys started flashing sand up that started making the slope uh, thing. There's a golf course in Connecticut, I don't want to say which one that I was at years ago, where the bunkers were raised up five or six feet. They brought them for they made all they made the whole thing like normal average bunkers, not these unique bunkers that these three guys designed. Uh, and basically took away the whole flavor of, of the golf course. Uh, you know, and, and, and they were changed. I think it was the 1960s or 70s to make it easier to mow the riding machine. But actually, this one course I'm thinking of, they made it so easy. It was a, a tractor driving on it with a gang mower behind it. One, one point about those bunkers, because you were talking about how difficult they are to mow the, the slopes, but there's an offset to that because what banks did with the bunkers, they're, they're flush. They're not they're flashed flat, up. They're flat. So the maintenance of the bunkers, in terms of the sand itself, right. is actually easier than 
than the flash bunkers that after rains tend to wash out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when they redid all these, the ones that did, un, you know, unfortunately redid their bunkers in the 1960s or 1970s with flash sand, those bunkers wash out. It's really only in the last 15 or 20 years that we have liars that help prevent that from happening. On that note, by the way, as you brought up the eighth hole, we've got a question for uh, Donnie. They want to know what the key is to be able to get the bunker faces so uh, so absolutely perfect. And at the same time, they have a question about keeping the green speed on number eight. Uh, I don't really understand his question, but that's how he asked it. <laughs> so he wants to know about how you mow the bunker on eight and how you keep the green speed on eight. Well, like I said, we, we drop rotary mowers down, you know, on ropes. And um, <clears throat> prior to me coming here, they used to do, use line trimmers, um, which doesn't give you as nice a, and as clean a cut. So I think the grass over the, the last several years has been getting stronger and healthier because of that much cleaner cut, uh, you know, keeping sharp blades. And I mean, I'm spraying the surrounds all the time. Um, at least, uh, you know, once a month they're getting sprayed. Um, so I, I mean, I drive right down through the bunkers and, you know, I'm hanging my, my boom over the top edge and I'm driving through the bunkers and I'm raising my booms and, you know, trying to get every uh, square inch of those bunker faces. And what I can't reach, I'm, I'm, I'm spraying with the hose. So, um, you know, that's how we've been successful with the bunker banks. Um, a lot of liquid fertility. Um, you know, we partnered up with Plant Food, which, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to be using their products. And then uh, as far as green speeds, I don't know. I mean, I just have been doing what I've learned my whole career. I've worked for a lot of good superintendents. And uh, I just copied their playbooks. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't go into exactly. There are so many different aspects to get green speed. I mean, there, there's quality of cut. There's fertility. There's, you, you know, the chemical management. So uh, water management, it, it's, it's all those pieces put together that just uh, keeps me, uh, I'd like to say, consistently for somewhere around 11 feet. So that's my goal. I'll tell you, Jay, that, that his practices since he's been here for almost six years have made a, a big difference um, in terms of the quality of the greens, the consistency of the speed and all that has really improved uh, under Donnie's uh, leadership. I'd also say uh, with regard to number eight, the reason that gentleman probably asked about number eight is that's the most dramatic uh, elevation change within a green itself on the course. It's almost six feet from the top tier down to the bottom tier. And that's probably why he's bringing that up, oh, particularly yeah. with regard to green speed. I think he was bringing it up because he keeps uh, having his ball roll back down the false front. <laughs> well, well, that, <laughs> that, I read that between the lines of the question. Once you start getting these greens up to 11 and a half, 12 feet, you know, the contours are pretty difficult out there. But they're, they're big enough so that they're always pinnable, even at the higher speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the great things about Fours Gate, especially for the amateur golfer, is that Banks gave you room to play the game off the tee, and he gave you a place to miss, and in particular, the miss is short. Okay, so a guy like me can think and dunk and bunt the ball around and put together a good round, as long as he doesn't do something stupid like get in the bunker on the side on 14. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got a couple of minutes left, so let's wrap up. I'll start. I just want to thank you for stewarding this critically important golf course in golf course history and golf course architecture. Forest Gate is a mile marker and an important one. It is the last course of the greatest architectural bloodline of the original Golden Age of Golf Course Architecture, and it stands out as one of the great recreations, restorations, renovation, whatever word you want to use, but one of the greatest and most important ones of the second golden age of golf course architecture. Well, Jay, one of the reasons we're able to do it is because we have people like you who appreciate what a unique and great golf course it is and are getting the word out. So so that's, that's always good. And, and we thank you uh, for your support. I also want to thank all of the attendees that were watching. Yes, this is recorded and it will be on YouTube. And watch out for uh, another article coming out discussing some of these template articles. 
Last word from Donnie, last word from Stephen. Anything to add? Uh, just uh, thanks, Jay. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss sports game. Yeah, and if, if anybody has any questions, there are people from around the country. Uh, you said those, you didn't say Tennessee, but you said Agompas. I know that's in Tennessee. Uh, that was not just on Black Rainer. Creek, yeah. yeah that's just One the, last the, question. Uh, to the Silva, who did a Seth Rayner style golf course. I would love if he wanted to email me or contact me. You'll find me on the ASGCA website. But uh, I just want to say that if any of you have questions about the golf courses, feel free to reach out to, to, to especially Donnie and I. I'm not sure how busy uh, Chris is here, but send me an email and I'll respond. Uh, and everything you said is right. Th this is a... It's a museum of how great the golf course was because it's really what it is. And we're trying to even get it back even more. We're slowly taking out trees. Unfortunately, in this township, there's a tree ordinance, so we can't take down as many as we want to take down right away. So we are slowly trying to get this golf course back uh, like a time machine, back to what it was. All right, well, let's send it back to Sharon at Golf Course Trades HQ. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, welcome back to Golf Course Trades HQ, and thank you all, beautiful job, very impressive, and wish you all the luck. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Okay.